I told you a guy one time, he said he grew up in a particular church, and every Sunday he left feeling so bad about himself and so guilty that he finally renamed his church to Our Lady of Perpetual Guilt. <laughs> All of us battle feelings of guilt. Guilt is a negative emotion. We call it a negative emotion because it's one of the sad emotions. It's associated with depression and unhappiness. It's a feeling of remorse, of regret. It's a feeling of failure that we've not lived up to the standards we set for ourselves. Guilt sometimes can help motivate us. Obviously, if we didn't have some guilt, we'd all be so ill past and we wouldn't have any concern about our moral and ethical boundaries, so it serves a very valuable place in our lives. But when we feel guilty, it needs to lead us to change and a plan of action, and the feeling itself needs to be resolved quickly because it has a de very debilitating effect upon us. It demeans our self-esteem, our self-worth. It makes us feel as though we're inadequate. It gives us a sense that we're always living in failure. Jesus Christ came into this world to deliver us from guilt. Psychologists have identified some very common forms of guilt that we all share. First of all, we feel guilt because of what we do. We did something wrong. We violated God's law or even maybe our own conscience, and we feel bad about that. Sometimes we're guilty for things we didn't do. We feel that we neglected something or someone, and we end up feeling bad about the good that we feel that we should have done. Sometimes we're guilty about what we thought about doing, but we didn't do it. We didn't act on the impulse, and instead of giving ourselves credit for that, we blame ourselves that we even had the impulse to start with. We blame ourselves that we got tempted or even had the desire to do that or even thought about doing it. We also have guilt because we don't feel like we did enough. We sometimes call this compassion fatigue. People that are in the helping professions often feel that way. Or, or maybe there's someone you're helping and you've done everything you know to do and their situation worsens and you blame yourself feeling like, well, if I had just done more, this wouldn't have happened and things would have turned out better. And then finally, sometimes we feel guilty because we have it better than other people. People that are in combat often feel this way. If they survive a situation and their colleagues fail in battle, they blame themselves, well, why, why did I survive? Why did I make it through that? And they didn't make it through that. And sometimes we can look out at human suffering and then we feel guilty that we have a good life and a comfortable life and that we're going through a good season when we see other people going through difficult times. The one thing that makes Jesus different is the fact that he came to save the world from its sins. And the feeling of sin is that feeling of guilt and failure. That's the reason he has the name Jesus. That's what the name Jesus means. It says in Matthew 1 and 21, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Not just the act of sin, but sometimes the feeling of sin and the feeling of guilt and failure. Jesus can save us and deliver us from that as well. The Bible tells us in John 3, 17, I find this an extraordinary statement of our Lord. Everybody knows the statement he made right before this one, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But this is the very next statement he made. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, we were already under condemnation. We already know our failure. God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. There was a very self-righteous man named Paul who met Jesus and finally came to terms that he needed a Savior as well. You see, good people need a Savior as well as a bad person does because we all have the sin problem. And he later writes in one of his last letters in 1 Timothy 1.15, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance by everybody. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. When I think about guilt and the feeling of guilt we have and the need to deal with it, I, one of my favorite stories is about a man who had something that he had been doing wrong for many years and he never dealt with it. And finally, his conscience got the best of him. He thought, I just need to go and confess this. And so he went to see a priest. 
When he got into the secrecy of the confessional, he finally opened up and said, I, I just I need to confess my sins, something that's been bothering me for many years. He said, I, I've worked at a company for about 25 years, and we're in the building material industry. And he said, I've been stealing lumber for years after year in building materials. And the priest said, well, how much lumber have you stolen? He said, well, I stole enough to build a house for my family and then a cottage in the mountains. And I've stolen enough to build a house for my son and his family and a house for my daughter and her family. The priest said, this is a serious offense. I've got to really think of a penance for you. He said, let me ask you, have you ever done a spiritual retreat? The man said, no, but if you can get the plans, I can get the lumber. I want to take you back to one of the most magnificent stories in the life of Jesus found in the Gospel of John, the eighth chapter, the opening first 11 verses. The Bible says at dawn he went back to the temple courts where he sat down to teach the people and the people gathered around him. Some of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who was caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and asked Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such a woman, but what do you say? They were using this as a question to accuse him in his own words. John 8, verse 6 says, but Jesus bent down and begin to write on the ground with his finger. This is the sixth time the finger of God appears in the Bible. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. They kept on questioning him, and he stood up and he said, whoever of you is without sin, let him be the first to cast the stone at her. Then he stooped down again and began to write again. After hearing this, they all began to leave one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. Then he stood up and said to the woman, has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. You and I share a lot in common with this woman. And that day our Lord bent down. The same way he bent down in Gethsemane when he submitted to the will of God, the posture of humility. John says that he stooped down, reminding me of the words of the psalmist, he stooped down to make me great. Isn't that an amazing statement? That God stooped down, that God came to this world through the incarnation of his son, God shared our humanity, God stooped down all the way to the cross to lift us up, and he wrote that day on the ground with his finger. He wrote the words, forgiven and free for all the world. You and I share a lot in common with this woman. Her story is our story. Here is a woman who was found out, and we all eventually get found out, and that's what brings us the feeling of guilt. In fact, the Bible says in Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sin will find you out. That's a scary verse of Scripture, isn't it? It says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man or woman reaps what they sow. And here is a woman who was found out. Seems like everybody's under investigation these days. We're all under investigation. We live in a world that has turned on itself, wanting to find everybody out. And how would you feel if everything you've ever done, everything you ever thought about doing was public knowledge? How would you feel? None of us could go out and face the world, could we? 
Aren't you glad some things aren't found out? It's a painful thing when things are found out. It's embarrassing and shameful. And this poor woman was humiliated. It says they made her stand before the group. They publicly exposed her to accuse her. And they were using this as an opportunity to trap him in something he would say. Maybe he would contradict the law of Moses and they could accuse him of blasphemy. The whole spirit that day was a spirit of accusation, investigation. She's been caught in the act. And what a frightening and alarming place, an embarrassing place that is to be found out. And sometimes it is just our own conscience that finds us out. And sometimes it's a private ministry of the Holy Spirit that reveals what's really going on in our hearts. You see, this is why you and I are taught by our Lord not to judge other people. These were teachers of the law. And they were Pharisees. They were spiritual leaders. And the job of spiritual people is to cover, not expose. Because none of us are qualified to judge others as they were doing that day. And when he wrote in the ground, eventually they realized they weren't qualified, and that's why they left and didn't press the matter. And nobody will keep pressing the matter to investigate people when they realize they're not any better. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 1, do not judge. Now, you and I talk about obeying the commandments of God. There is one. There's a three-word commandment. And when we violate a commandment of God, that's what we call sin. So in exposing their sin, they sinned by the very mechanism of exposing the woman. Do not judge, Jesus says, or you too will be judged. Anybody here want to be judged? Anybody here want to be found out? Anybody here want to be exposed to the world? I didn't think so. So Jesus said, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with a measure you use, it will be measured to you again. And that day, they came in judgment of her, but when he stooped and bent and wrote in the ground, eventually the judgment came back on them, and they realized, well, they're no better than her. And so they all began wanted it. They came as a group. They came as a mob. And one-on-one, -on -one, they began to deal with their own issues, and they slipped away in the older ones first. Maybe they had more skeletons in the closet. They were just smarter. You see, man exposes people to destroy them. And you see that going on in our world today, don't you? The reason humanity exposes other people is to destroy them. But God exposes our sin to us by the Holy Spirit to deliver us. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. You see, only God has the power and the right to expose. We have the ministry of covering. Turn to somebody and say, I got you covered. Here was a woman who also was frightened. I mean, who can imagine the terror of the woman that day when they said, in the law? I mean, the law itself is terrifying for any of us, right? The cop pulls you over for something. They said, you know why I'm pulling you over, right? I love the way they ask that. At least they're assuming you don't know why. But the answer is, you broke the law somewhere, right? It's a frightening thing when the law is used against any of us in any form. And that's what they did that day. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. She was caught in the act. We don't know when this was. Was this recent? 
Was this, a past, was this 10 years ago? Nobody knows what this even means, how they found this information out. But now they're going to bring her face to face with the law of God. In the law, Moses, and that's what they were trying to get him to do. They were trying to get him to contradict the law of Moses so they could accuse him of blasphemy and discredit his ministry. They didn't care anything about this woman. They didn't care anything about sentencing her. They only cared about trapping him. That's what this was about. Here's a group of people who know the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. Here's a group of people who are trained in the law, and they should know everything in the law, not part of the law. Here is a group of teachers of the law who only want to focus on one part of the law and not all of the law. You see, the law of God in the Old Testament, like any law, states the offense and the maximum penalty, but it's never applied to the fullest extent of the law. No law is. And the law of Judaism was not. That's why King David committed adultery. Nobody called for his stoning. They didn't practice stoning like that. Those penalties in the law were common in all of the ancient world. They were very common penalties. The difference of the Judea, Judeo law was it also had to be applied with mercy. He said they quoted this part of the law, you shall not commit adultery, but they forgot the other part, Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. They, they forgot that one, or they wouldn't have been there in the first place. You see, the same Bible people you to judge, use to judge others is going to judge them. The Bible says in the book of James, the second chapter, whoever is guilty of breaking the law at one point is guilty of breaking the entire law. They forgot Hosea 6 and 6, that God desires mercy, not sacrifice. They forgot Micah 6 and 8, that God has shown you what's good, that he requires of you to act justly, to love mercy. Mercy would have never had that woman there. Mercy would have covered over a multitude of sins. You see, they knew one part of the law, but they didn't know the other part. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And here are people that wanted to apply the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law or the intent of the law. And they forget what James chapter 2, verse 13 says about the law. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Say it with me. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Say it again. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let people accuse you of being too merciful, but don't ever let people accuse you of being too judgmental. Here is a woman who was condemned. The word condemnation means a verdict of guilty, and we share that in common. Who among us is not guilty of violating the laws of God, of the laws of society? Sometimes we violate our own conscience. Here is a woman who was condemned by the law itself. And that's what the law of God does. It reveals sin. It doesn't save us. Romans 3 and 20 says, by keeping the law, will no one be justified before God? Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. If the book didn't say you shall not kill, if it didn't say you shall not commit adultery, if it didn't say you shall not murder, well, we wouldn't know. But the law reveals sin, but it doesn't save us. And she faced the law of God that day, and it revealed her sin. And we need the law of God to reveal our sin so that we can repent and be forgiven. She was also condemned by the community. It's a frightening thing when people are in the ministry. They're your spiritual leaders, and they're the ones out to get you. That is a frightening place to be. The one person you always want on your side is your pastor. The one person you want to go to your defense, I've been asked to appear with court in, with people to be a character witness. For, nobody's ever asked me to be a character witness against them. I write letters for people all the time to help with immigration or legal situation. 
And you've got spiritual leaders there that day who are bent on this woman's destruction and the destruction of Jesus' ministry. A community of accusation, a community of condemnation, and sometimes that happens. We find that people even condemn us. She faced that judgment that day, the guilt by this community of people. And she felt guilty by her own conscience. She had committed adultery, which means that is relations outside of a marriage. So here's a marriage being threatened and destroyed probably because of this. And I'm sure her own conscience had convicted her of this act. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, that even people that have never heard the law of God also have the same guilt because the law of God is written on the conscience, and the conscience condemns us as well as defends us. And here was a woman who felt the verdict of guilt from the commandment of God, from the community, and even from her own conscience. But here was a woman in the middle of all of that who was forgiven. Jesus bent down, and he wrote on the ground with his finger. The finger of God reaches into a world of condemnation and shame and writes a message that you are forgiven and you are free. And Jesus that day defended this woman. That's why he came into the world, and they brought her to the right person. A day they thought was going to end in accusation ended in atonement. A day they thought was going to end in judgment ended in mercy because that day mercy triumphed over judgment. Only Jesus was left and mercy can silence all the accusers in your life. Until the only one left speaking for you is not the commandment It is not the community. It's not even your conscience. It is the living Christ who says you're forgiven and you are free. Jesus takes his place that day as our intercessor, as our defense attorney. Did you notice what one of the titles for Jesus in the Scripture is our defense attorney? It's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. My, My dear children, I write to you that you do not sin. But if anyone does sin... He has an advocate, that means a defense attorney, one who speaks to the Father on our behalf. Jesus always speaks for you, never against you. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. I mean, you get in trouble with the law, what are you called? You want a defense attorney, right? You don't want to ever face the law by yourself. And they brought her to Jesus, and Jesus stood up. He bent down to write the story of grace the same way he bent down to leave the glory of heaven and to come to this planet and die on a cross. He stooped down to make us great. But when he finished writing, he stood up in his place of power and authority. And when he stood up, he became that woman's defense attorney that day, and he stood between her and everything else. And that's what a defense attorney says. You're not going to get to my client. I'm here to protect my client. That day, Jesus stood between that woman and the commandment. The commandment of God condemned her. But Jesus' blood covers the commandment, and God no longer hears the voice of the law speaking to him, revealing our sin. God hears the blood of Jesus speaking to him. That's what it says in Hebrews 12 and 24, that the blood of Jesus is better than the blood of Abel. Remember the first man murdered back in Genesis, that it said his blood speaks from the ground, and the writer of Hebrews used that analogy and says the blood of Jesus was shed at Calvary, and now there's a blood better than Abel's that speaks on your defense. And that's why in the Old Testament, I don't want to give you too much of a Bible lesson today, but how many of you saw the Raiders of the Lost Ark? You know what the Ark of the Covenant is? That little gold box they had in the temple of the Lord with the angels on it. Inside of it was the law of Moses. That's where those two commandments of stone stayed for hundreds and hundreds of years until the Babylonians destroyed the temple. Inside the Ark of the Covenant were the tablets of stone, the law of God. On top of that Ark of the Covenant, there were two angels. God, the psalmist said, dwells between the 
cherubim that represent the holiness of God, giving the people of Israel a mental picture that God hears the law speaking upward toward him, and the law reveals our sin. And one day a year in October, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest took off his garments. I'm about to preach here this morning. He took off his robes of royalty as Jesus took off his divinity. And that priest went in there with a simple white linen ephod. And he took a little blood from the sacrifice in a bowl with hyssop, a little branch. And it says he sprinkled that blood seven times. That's the number of completion and perfection. He sprinkled it right on top of that lid of the Ark of the Covenant, right between those two golden angels. And what did that symbolize? Atonement means cover. The law is inside the box, speaking to God, revealing the sin. The blood is sprinkled on top of the law so that God no longer hears the law speak. He hears the blood speak on your behalf. That's what that imagery means on the Day of Atonement. Let's give Him praise this morning. You're forgiven and you're free. And everything and everybody that condemns you, get behind Jesus and let Him defend you. So he stood between the woman and the commandment. He stood between the woman and the community. When people accuse you or condemn you, remember what it says in Romans 8, 31 through 34. If God before us, who can be against us? And this is what he's talking about. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Who shall bring anything to the charge of God's elect? It is Christ who died and is risen again and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Whoever lives to make intercession for us. That doesn't mean that Jesus ever lives to pray for you. It means Jesus ever lives to defend you. He stood between that woman and those accusers until none were left. And he stood between that woman and her own conscience. Only the Lord Jesus can deliver you from your own conscience. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 14, how much more, everybody say, how much more? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish unto God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, that you may serve the living God one of my favorite scriptures is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, when John writes, this is how we set our hearts at rest in God's presence. Don't you want to set your heart at rest? Sometimes I just, so I just need to set my heart at rest. This is how we set our hearts at rest in God's presence. Even if our own hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. You know what's greater than your own conscience condemning you is what Jesus wrote in the sand that day. You're forgiven and you're free. You see, the word of Jesus is a greater word than the word of your own conscience. Let Jesus cleanse your conscience. Let Jesus' word of forgiveness be a greater word than even your own emotions when you can't forgive yourself. I remember having a woman ask me one time after a service, she was up in years and she got to thinking about leaving this world and going to heaven and all of a sudden she had all this anxiety, was having panic attacks. She said, Pastor, all my life I've heard about heaven, how wonderful it is and our soul is eternal, but now the thought of going to heaven, it terrifies me. She said, when I get to heaven, is it, it's, when I go before the judgment seat of the Lord, is it God going to put up a big movie theater screen and replay everything in my life, everything I've ever thought, everything I've ever done. I'm terrified of going. I said, absolutely not. The blood of Jesus has covered your past. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 17, we have confidence on the day of judgment. Nothing you've thought, nothing you've thought about doing, nothing you've done, nothing you ever thought about doing, none of that's ever going to come up. The blood of Jesus has covered it. Your sins are atoned for. You have confidence on the day of judgment. You're going to hear two things, welcome and well done, good and faithful servant. And it ended that day with freedom. This woman was a woman who was free. She was found out. She was frightened. She was forgiven. But then she was free. 
Not enough to be forgiven. You got to be free to live your life. Go now and leave your life of sin. Those three words are important for you and for me to hear the Lord say, go. Now, you know I like that word. That's one of my favorite words. I'm all about going. I'm never about staying. Anybody else? I like that word. Let your life always move forward from where you are or where you were. Don't stay in the place of failure or guilt or sin. Don't stay there. Go. Turn to somebody and say, go. Get going. Come on, you do that on Mondays in the traffic. You say, get going. It can be a very affirming word. You can always write a new chapter in your life. That's what he was telling her. Go from this place and go now. You see, the gospel of Jesus is always a gospel of now. Whatever God says to you, do it now. I love 2 Corinthians 6 and 2. Now is the day of salvation. And leave. Leave your life of sin. Whatever it was she was involved in, leave, leave this here. Leave it right here in the temple courts. Leave it right here in the dust of the ground. But leave it. When you go, don't take it with you. Don't take the guilt and the shame and the fear and the embarrassment. Leave all that stuff here. And maybe coming to church this morning and watching somewhere around the world, this moment, this incredible moment of worship can be a place that you leave that stuff here. Quit coming to the house of God, hearing the grace, hearing the word, and then taking all this baggage with you. Leave it here. Turn to somebody and say, leave it here. You ever heard that gospel song, leave it there, leave it there? Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. You too can be forgiven and free. Jesus' word to you and to me. It's the same word he gave that woman. It's an eternal word. Go now and leave. You're forgiven and you're free. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We thank you for amazing grace, Lord. How sweet the sound that saved people just like us. I pray that your grace today will bring healing and deliverance Bring a fresh start and a new start to people in need of saving grace today, delivering grace, people that have been in bondage to guilt and the fear of punishment, feeling inadequate, feeling like failures. Break that burden off of their hearts and souls today and set them free to live in the joy of what it really means to be forgiven, I pray. Just whisper prayer, Lord, I receive your forgiveness today. Set me completely free from guilt and condemnation. Pray out loud, Lord, help me today to go, to write a new chapter, to go now, and to leave behind everything that holds me back. Pray out loud, Lord, today, I leave it here in Jesus' name.